Hebrews, found in the New Testament of the Bible. If you are following along in our uh, Pew Bibles, we're going to be on page 1069. By the way, as I would say each week, if you do not have a copy of the Bible, God's Word, in a readable, accurate translation, or maybe you have a copy but you just can't decipher it, uh, we, we use this CSB. Um, it is by no means the perfect uh, translation, but it is very accurate, it is very reliable, um, and uh, we want to provide one that is useful for you. So if you don't have one, feel free to take that copy and use it. And when I say it is not perfect, all English translations are, in fact, just that. They are English translations of the original scriptures of Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And so the only perfect, 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 perfect printed edition that you would find would be a copy of the Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. But that would make a little bit difficult for those who would say, that's all Greek to me. And um, so... uh, I'm going to go do our best when we look at an English translation. And no, I did not say all that just to get to that joke and that punchline. But it just happened. It, it's up here. I, I'm sorry. It's a part of who, who you got as pastor. But today we're looking again at this letter's declaration that overall its, its entire theme is that Jesus is of far more worth, far more greater preciousness far more treasure, far more worthy of worship, far superior, far more excellent than any other element in our life, any other relationship, any other object that we could ever possess, ever hold in our hands. That is what we have when we have Jesus. And yet, something so precious, someone who is so treasured and so worthy of our adoration, our, our worship, our praise it is so easy for us to get bitter it is so easy for us to sometimes lose sight of what this life is meant to be in worshiping him and no wonder that happens we humans are for one fickle creatures we are we change our minds every single day in in some form or fashion we'll we'll do something one day and then just decide just for the sense of changing, we're going to do something different the next. Sometimes we'll get mad about something and, and all of a sudden a position we once held is automatically different because just because we're mad at another situation. We're fickle. We're also prone to this fickleness and, and this, this looking at God and missing Him because we face the pressures the pressures that, that are mounting because of maybe our uncertainty and knowledge of who God is. The pressures that mount because maybe those that are close to us, our loved ones, do not see Jesus the same way that we do. They haven't grown in that way. And, and that pressure in the home is, is very perplexing and often causes us struggles with uncertainty. That is certainly a part of what the Hebrews that the writer was writing to were experiencing they had come to this knowledge that jesus was indeed the promised messiah the one who is fully god and yet fully man they had come to an understanding of what it meant to be saved and what true faith looked like and that it wasn't a matter of just keeping with certain traditions and certain rituals that on this day we do this and on this day we don't do this or this is the type of food we eat but this is not the type of food we eat. It wasn't all about that. It was, an, it was a life of worshiping him in a way that, that grows in their knowledge of him and grows in helping others in their knowledge of him. They had gotten to this place and their home was not all exactly always that scenario because some of their Hebrew paternal background and ancestors and relatives had not come to that place where they had seen that Jesus was the very Messiah that was promised, even in their own scriptures. Perhaps the the reason that sometimes we're fickle is not only the pressure at home, but the reluctance of what will my treasuring of Jesus do in light of a world that is hostile to the gospel. 
In a light of a world that, that to say that Jesus is superior, is better, is the only way, truth in life, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is God, and there is no one but him and no one like him, that is a message that is, tends to be hostile in the world. And we grow bitter when we, we have our reluctance and we say, I know what I should be doing, or at least what my pastor or my Bible teacher or my time in the Bible says I should be doing, but the fact that I'm not doing it, it builds a resentment in me. And, and we begin taking that resentment against what should be resent against sin, and we start resenting God and saying, God, I wouldn't feel this way if you didn't tell me to do this, instead of... I'm not doing this, and I know I should be mad at myself, but I want to turn my anger on someone else. And all the while, the Bible is reminding us that God is a holy, good, perfect, righteous, glorious, wise Father. And that his purposes in directing us and shaping us and even in his commands, giving us instruction, but also in his work personally in us, there is a sense of his discipline. Sometimes the reason that resentment will come is because not that there's a reluctance from what might happen, but there is a pain because of what did happen. And we wonder and start weighing, is really holding up the message that Jesus is better? Jesus is who he says he is. Is it worth it? And discipline is driving us to an answer that says yes. And this is where the writer of Hebrews is getting us to in this moment. So would you stand with me in the honor of reading God's word? We stand for so many things to give them honor and show them their worth. Today we're going to see and look at God's perfect word that he has given us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, useful for correcting us, useful for shaping us, useful for rebuking us. And after the writer has just finished this this beautiful picture of the hall of fame for faith, these figures that trusted in the Lord, and after giving this charge to run the race with endurance, this is what he says. In verse 3 and following. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son... Do not take lightly the Lord's dis- do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives endure suffering as discipline God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. We're going to stop there. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be 
hearers of your word, not letting it just go in one ear and out the other, but really listening. I pray that today you would help us be those that receive your word, that our hearts are open to it, our minds, though they are sometimes stubborn, sometimes our souls are feeble. I pray that we would receive it and know the good that comes from it. I pray that when it comes to acting upon it with our will, with our, with our strength, with our bodies, that you would make us mobile in that way. That we would not be stagnant. We would not be stale. We would not be staunchly opposed to following after you. But, but Lord, you would help us, lead us. And we would see the good of being guided, corrected, disciplined and even rebuked at times because all of those are acts of your love to your adopted by grace by the gospel children in jesus name we pray amen you may be seated so our goal each week as we share is to help people have an understanding of what the text says to read it and 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 listen to it and 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 have it available that's why we want to make sure that if you don't have a bible we get one into your hands ultimately our goal is to get into your heart but the first step is having a bible so we can see what the text says and by seeing what it says we can then again answer the question what does it mean and as i've said we've read reading this letter from hebrews over the last several months and and looking at the fact that it was written to an uncertain people who were followers of jesus in an uncertain time and that should be just as relevant as it was then as it as it should be now It, it should be a part of who we are because we can all admit there are times of uncertainty in us and and there are uncertain circumstances that we face in our world in our homes in our culture But nevertheless, it does not take away from the central truth, the power that is found in Jesus' name, in Jesus making himself known to us. So we're going to see that. But then we're going to begin, as you listen, you may find how things apply to you. The meaning will never change from the word, but the application in your life, it may get very personal. And it's not that I have researched your lives or or anything like that. I, I haven't. I know my faults, my weaknesses. I know where I struggle. I know where I need to be corrected and disciplined. And that might resonate with you. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit will sometimes take the meaning of the word and show you precisely, specifically, that applicable place where it's going to demand the question, will you trust what I'm saying here? Because the meaning will drive itself as the Holy Spirit guides the living and effective word that he has given us. And here the topic of discipline comes up, and if we're just honest, that's not a subject many of us like to talk about. I mean, we like to talk about it when it benefits others or benefits things we like. So like whenever your favorite sports team is, is doing well and, and they're like a well-oiled machine and, and, and man, they're winning, they're people that you can cheer for. One of the things you might say, man, they are disciplined in the fundamentals. They are disciplined in their formation. They're disciplined in their strength, man. They're disciplined in knowing these plays. They're well-disciplined. We like that because we can cheer on and it does not cost us anything. You realize that, right? It, it cost us nothing to cheer for those that are winning. But when it comes to discipline in our home, we as parents are sometimes, where is the line? And, and what is the length of discipline or correction that I need to go to in this circumstance? We know it needs to happen, but we get uncertain sometimes about what it looks like. But then whenever the mirror is turned and we see our reflection and the, and the discipline comes upon us, that's the time where we're like, okay, it's a little too costly. It's a little too painful. I don't know if I want to go there. But what we need to understand is that God is correcting us and changing in us in order to create such a dependence on him that he prepares us for what's coming in the future. 
That as we walk around and, and walk towards the future and right in the here and now and toward what's ahead, we recognize that no matter what we go through, because of the discipline of the Lord, because of his strength showing us what we need to be accomplished, we're reminded that he is with us all along the way. And he will never give up on us. And we can depend on him that where our strength, where our hands may fail, he does not. So I want to give you a basic outline. It is going to be on the text behind us. But I want to give you the seven points that are going to be laid out for today. Um, We will only really be discussing the first four today. The next three will be next Sunday. But I'm going to give you all seven today so you get a little bonus. So we're going to be looking at how the Lord first creates his disciples. We're going to be looking at how the Lord corrects said disciples we're going to be looking at how the lord changes those disciples yes i know sometimes we think heaven forbid i would ever have to change a thing but the gospel changes us through and through we're going to be looking at how the lord charges his disciples and 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 admonishes us we're going to be looking at the how the lord challenges his disciples you may say charge and challenge i know you're trying to get more points with big c words but those are the same thing no and that'll be next week and you'll learn how the challenge is different from the charge we're going to be looking at how the lord crowns his disciples and we're going to be looking at how the lord consumes his disciples fully how we are in him so all that to say we're going to be looking at those topics and 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 should you feel the need to to fill those in in your in your sermon notes or Bible app or however you're following along, feel free to do so. But first of all, we're looking at how the Lord creates his disciples. The very first three words of this statement that we read today was, for consider him. It is not missing out on the fact that Jesus is involved in this process through and through. That Jesus is the very pen that, that is the reason we exist. He's the one that wrote out our story. He's the one that, that said, I believe this person is a good idea. I mean, think about that. With all of our foibles, with all of our flaws and mistakes and failures, Jesus, in the beginning, when we were knit together in our mother's womb, our father penning that, the author of our faith, said that person is a good idea you exist because god said you were a good idea even with our sin even with our unrighteousness our unholiness our wickedness at times god loved us in that way that he the reason we even are here is because jesus is the pen that wrote our story that's why the bible says that he is the source or your version may say The author and perfecter of our faith. He's the founder of it. And so we need to realize that we are all dependent on being a disciple of Jesus. First of all, because God began writing our story. We would not be here were it not for him. And that's how much he loves you. First and foremost, that's how much he loves you. He thought you were a good idea and put it on paper. Second. Jesus is not only the pen that thought you were a good idea, he's the perfecter that brings it to completion. You know, some people wonder how they might end up in a church on on any given Sunday. I am a firm believer in God's providence that, that there are no mistakes and coincidences. That God, with his divine hand, as he has worked throughout history to orchestrate everything according to his purposes, has also worked in our history according to his purposes. Now, it doesn't mean that everything that we did was perfect, but it did not misstep with where God was placing you to get you on the path towards completing his good work in you. And so for every child of God, what we need to recognize is that we may have come to a place of faith and then we may mess up and then we may mess up and we may mess up and we may mess up. And that doesn't mean it's okay to mess up, but we may just keep doing that and beating ourselves up for it. But God is bringing us to this place because he said, I am not through with you. I am the perfecter. And if you are seeking perfection in any other place other than me, you are misguided. He is the one who is the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is not only the perfecter that the Bible is telling us to consider, he is the prize. That's why it says to keep our eyes on Jesus, to consider him. 
to remember him, that he is the very great reward. I know that at times we, we preach about the glories of heaven, and man, I, I do look forward to heaven. I, I, I do honestly want to spend a little more time here with my family and that kind of thing. I'm glad for that. And I look forward to heaven one day. But the greatest joy of heaven is not heaven. The greatest joy of heaven is Jesus. That he's there. Because he's the reason it exists. He's the one who has made it perfect. He's the one who has prepared it. And he is the prize that we are to keep our eyes on. But I love this about Jesus. That not only is he the prize that one day we get to meet gloriously one day. But the Bible says that he's also the path. That he's the one that is the way, the truth, and the life. That he's there ahead, but he's also here that we have our footing on. He says, I let you walk my way. I've created this for you. But that also Jesus is the prize and he's the path that I get to walk along. But the Bible, Jesus says he's also the partner that is never going to leave us. I mean, that's what Matthew 11 says. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my way is easy and my burden is light. In other words, Jesus saying, I'm the one that's going to share this load and walk with you, and I'm really carrying the brunt of it. The Bible tells us that let us not make any mistake. Everything that's going to be about this life of faith and and practice and principles is going to drive us directly to look at Jesus. And any faith that doesn't, any faith that's just a bunch of how-tos and how to make yourself look right or feel right or, or act right, but doesn't cause us to to focus wholly on Jesus as the author and perfecter of our faith. That is a misleading faith. And that will not create a disciple. That will create a disaster. Because you'll fall into the same category that we all fall into and funnel into, that I will find my hope and happiness in this activity, in this sense of self, in this sense of enjoyment, in this sense of pleasure, in this sense of accomplishment, in this sense of status, and yet we'll miss out on Jesus. And we're meant to look at him, the author and perfecter of our faith. And as we look at him, we are to be corrected. That we don't even understand that it's the Lord himself, Jesus, that creates his disciples through the gospel, through his work of the cross that he did and took upon himself in our place because of our sin. And we come, into, come to him repentant and he saves us and he gives us the title of image bearer and child of God and adopted by grace and living for glory. He gives us this. He creates that in us, but he also corrects us as we live. Because even then, while we may, be, we may be perfectly righteous positionally before Jesus, like we stand just as if we had never sinned before because of his righteousness, that stamp, that, that status is already there. That positional righteousness is there. But that practical righteousness, us getting it right, us acting right, us talking right, us doing right, that part still has to be shaped. And this is where the Lord corrects his disciples. And here the, the, the reader is hearing from the writer that when we look to Jesus, one of the things we're going to note, we may be going through very painful times. We may be going through the most agonizing, excruciating moment of our life. It may be a time where we feel the rebuke of the Lord, where he is stopping us in our tracks and saying, you will not go any further. I had to hold myself back saying, you shall not pass. I know it was there. And I still said it. But there are times where that staunch rebuke will come. And it may be painful, but the Lord has his purpose there. It may be the fact that we're wondering why God is pruning us in this moment, why God is there with a chisel taking this, what we think is not a bad thing, away. 
And yet the Bible says in those times, so that we don't go into the root of bitterness, so that we don't throw ourselves a pity party where we're the only one invited, we're to consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. Look at what Jesus did for you. Look at how much he loves you. Measure it against the cross. Measure your worst day against the cross and it will not compare. It just won't. And this is what we're to do to consider him who did this at the hostility of sinners against himself. The one who had everything to lose and yet did it willingly. It's a reminder that life is not as bad as you may propose it to be. Because when we start saying that, here's where it leads to. God does not understand me. And if God does not understand me, God cannot help me. What was the very first lie that Eve took? God doesn't understand you. He's trying to keep the best from you. God cannot help you. Eat this, it'll help you. Take this, it'll help you. It leads to all sorts of dangerous places. But the cross beckons us to look and say, oh, God does understand you. And he understands you to the uttermost so much that he was willing to take the utterly devastating above devastations for you. That's how much he understands you. And that's why he alone is your helper. It's a reminder that this is not the time to be discouraged considering the great examples of those who remain steadfast amidst far greater hardships. In verse 4, it says, In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. It speaks to those who were martyrs. In verse 7, I mean, in chapter 12, it says that there were those who were tortured. There's those that did not accept release so they may gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings as well as bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned and not the kind that we think of here in Michigan. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. He's saying, some of you feel like you've had a bad day, but it's not really cost you to the point where you're having to give your own blood for it. So don't lose focus in the middle of these hardships. It's a reminder to recall and reassure yourselves with God's word. Verse 5, the word is presented, My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly, and do not lose heart when you are reproved by him. In other words, do not have disdain for God's word. Do not look at it and say, "Ah, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't apply. And do not be dismayed when God brings about hardship because the word has already said, this is what the Lord will do to those he loves. It's a reminder that that discipline at its root is to teach or instruct us that being united in God's correction, it has the good God-glorifying growth of our souls at the end. That is the direction because God is addressing us as sons. He's doing it out of love. Now there are multiple times, types of discipline, by the way. I'm just going to highlight a few that are in the, in the scriptures. There is, first of all, corrective discipline. This is the firm, restricting, stopping you in the moment discipline. Where you are causing that which is iniquity and transgression and rebellion against God's word and also causes affliction for those that God loves, including yourself. An example of this would be God dealing with David. When you look at the the account of David in 2 Samuel, 
after he has committed adultery, after he has bared false witness, after he has committed conspiracy, after he has committed murder, after he has, con- in the middle of tried to covering it up, condoned what he's done and presented himself as righteous. The discipline against David and his family was, was great and devastating. It was God's corrective discipline. A winch David said in Psalm 51 against you, Lord, have I, you are the reason I've been afflicted. I, I recognize it was my iniquity that did this. I recognize it's you that corrected me. We see this also in the New Testament. Because just lest we think, oh, that's only an Old Testament thing trying to correct people when they do wrong and when they sin. This is what Paul writes to First Corinthians, uh, to the Corinthian church in First Corinthians. He tells them that this is, this is the example you're to live out in, in putting away the sinner who, who openly is defying the, the commandments of the Lord. This is how you are to set aside your life whenever you're taking, a part of, taking part of the Lord's Supper, that you, you're to examine yourselves and to see where you are, to correct yourselves. There's preventative discipline. An example of this. An example of this in modern day is forest clearing. In the middle of a forest fire situation, one of the things that firefighters do is they go and they clear away any obstacles that might prevent the believers, I mean the the people in the middle of it from being overwhelmed. An example of this in the Scriptures is where Paul invites Timothy to say, even though it's not required of you in your walk with God to observe the practice of circumcision, I don't want anyone to have fuel to come against your ministry. And so I would advise you to do this. As someone who is partially Jewish, partially Greek, I would advise you to do this even as as an older male. That seems like a really difficult decision. It seems like a really difficult dis- discipline, but it was preventing a consuming of Timothy's life from those who would use it as a target against him. Educational discipline is there in the Scripture. This is looking at Job's life, where Job had not done anything worthy of such grave suffering. It's a remarkable book when you look at Job and you say, how do bad things happen to good people? Man, Job is an excellent account of that. And sometimes it's a direct message. The Lord teaches us through the fires of suffering what we could not find any other place. And that is why Job in 42, 4 through 6, says, I thought I knew. I had heard of you. But now I have seen you and I've learned. And and what I have, I repent. He had not done anything really difficult other than I don't understand and I'm beginning to question God. That was the only thing he had to repent of. But he was being educated by God's discipline. Why does God do this? Why does God correct us in this way? The Bible gives us these reasons in verses 7 through 11. First of all, he has paternal reasons. He does it because the discipline proves, first and foremost, that He is our Father. He is the one that in His grace has chosen to adopt us. He is the one that has chosen to give us His name. We have been made His children. And as Him being our Father, He does this. He gives the example of illegitimate children. In In the days of Rome, it was not a strange occurrence for there to be illegitimate children, just as in our culture today. People who have no fathers to give them a name to be present in their life and they had no correction they may have had resources they may have been able to achieve certain things but what they never could prove is this person is my dad because he was not there so god has good reason for stepping in paternal reasons he has comparative reasons for stepping in in the way that he does. Because he 
You know how we compare things and we weigh them out and we say, if this equals this, and I add this, it's going to be greater. It's going to be better. Maybe looking at our account, if $100 is good, then $200 is certainly better. We have comparative reasons, right? We began looking at things greater than, less than. Well, the Bible says this is a part of who we are. He says we had human fathers that disciplined us, and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits who lives? If we can say having an earthly father that did good was good in my life, Having a heavenly Father who knows everything in perfection, shouldn't that be better? He gives us the sanctifying reasons because this discipline makes us more like God in our holiness. And He gives us, honestly, a reward mentality reason. Because while there is pain now, there is a harvest produced in us later. It says, no dis- discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful later on. However, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There is a reward that is good. And if you're wanting the reward, man, dig into the discipline. This is how the Lord changes us. These last two areas that are not only about correction, but they're about changing and shaping us for who we should be. Once again, that sanctification process that that a holy God would have it in his mind to make those children he redeemed who now bear his image, who carry his name, who are adopted into his family would also be holy. There's a sanctification reason that that we call it this process of sanctification. That just as I said earlier, you are saved and positionally righteous as you could be. The moment you trust Jesus, you are clean. You are new. You are forgiven. You are holy. But the practical righteousness, it comes as God sanctifies us, purifies us, refines us. He changes us also because we begin finding our satisfaction in other things. We begin seeing the results. We begin seeing and saying, you know what? I don't like doing this, but man, I like where it gets me. I'll be honest. I hate doing budget stuff hate it loathe it but i see the principle that when it's put into practice i like the results i like the results i do not like going to the gym i do not like being on a keto diet there's so many things i want to eat that have potatoes and bread in them. Five guys fries. Oh. Let me ready to quit this sermon right now and just go get a bag. And the sanctification process may be painful, but the satisfaction, though, at the end is the results. Man, I like it when I can take care of my family better. I like it when I can fit in my clothes better and I can feel better. It may be painful in the process, yet later it yields something. And when it comes to righteousness, there are things I'm like, why would God ask us to do that? That doesn't seem right. I mean, I'm going to be boring if I do and live like this. But the results of living a life that where I'm freed of, of, of the guilt of, of just continuing following in this habit and this habit... And, and being overburdened by this obstacle and this obstacle. Man, there's satisfaction in that. But it only comes through the process of change. It only comes through the process of discipline and correction. We also see how the Lord charges His disciples. This is in verses 12 through 13. Where the charge is, in light of all this, He says, therefore, it means in light of all this, all that I've just made the case, 
Strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. In other words, the charge is this. Run with fortitude. Don't run like you're defeated. Don't run and be like, oh, woe is me. You know how I could tell when a runner or, or someone is defeated? And even, maybe not even that. You know when a, a runner from, in baseball knows he's not getting to first base? He's not charging at the base. He just does his jog out there because he knows he's being thrown out. He knows he's defeated. He knows that going out of the box. And yes, running in the race that God has called us to, just as in life, you can see those runners who are exhausted, who feel like something's out of whack and they're walking with a gimp and and everything else because they've been running so long that their bodies just worn, slap out. The same thing is true with disciples. But the thing is that the mercies of God are new every morning. And while our feeble bodies may wear out, the, the, the check engine light may come on on these physical frames. But God renews his mercy every day. His strength, it overwhelms us. His spirit, it fully empowers us. And the charge is, get up. Strengthen. Don't. Give the run out, come out of the gate just defeated already. Know that God is with you. He's the pen that started it. He's the perfecter. He's the prize and the path. And, and He is the partner that's with you. Don't give up. Strengthen those tired hands and weakened knees. Secondly, not only run with fortitude, but run with family. Run with family. Why this? Because whenever your lives look renewed in the grace and glory and goodness of God, when you are trained by Him and your lives spiritually, which begins overflowing to everything else, begin being strengthened, and that which was tired and weakened becomes renewed, and you begin walking those straight paths, those who were once lame, Won't be lame anymore. They'll start saying, I need to get up and run with him. Because he didn't give up. She didn't stop. Because they declare in their life, Jesus is worth it. And you know what? They're living it out that Jesus is worth it. I am not going to sit here lame and dislocated either. I'm going to find and be renewed by the grace and glory and goodness and power of the Lord. And no longer be stagnant and stale. I'm going to join in with my family and run in the discipline of our loving, good, wise, holy Father who is faithful with us every step of the way. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, today, um, as we come to this conclusion, I, I pray that you would help anyone who has needed your word in this way to I pray that you would move in their heart in a way that's unique for this moment. I don't know what that'll look like. I don't know even what that really means. But Lord, for the the hearer that needs to listen and receive your word, I pray that you would display extraordinary grace and good in this moment. For those that are going through times of suffering, and they may not understand why, because they're trying to be faithful and following you, God, show them how... This may be something that is preventative. It may be something educational in the process, but it is never, it is never done without you as a good, loving Father walking beside them. And for those disciples, and this is me included, that have the flaws and, and, and the fickleness, and sometimes we turn and we, we just sin. And I wish we had a good excuse, but we just do it, and, and we know it's rebellion. Help us, Lord, to receive your correction, knowing us that you as a father, you see every little detail of our life, and yet you lovingly have provided grace that would save us and redeem us, and you have never left us or forsaken us, that you are a father who loves. 
Wherever we may fall today, Lord, I pray that we would come humbly to you who has graciously made yourself known to us. In Jesus' name, amen. This time, as our musicians are...